aside from Piaget, we also need to talk about Lev Vygotsky. So Lev Vygotsky was born the same year as Jean Piaget, but unfortunately did not live as long. He actually died at the age of 37. Despite that shortened lifespan, his contribution to developmental psychology is still huge. So let's talk about Lev Vygotsky. He was a cognitive developmentalist, but instead of looking at just how kids could construct their own learning, Vygotsky focused on how learning could be improved through social interaction, through language, and through cultural interactions. And so what we mean by this is the idea that through language it can shape how we think, as well as through mentoring and interactions with others it can shape how we think. He actually believed that things like tutors and mentors and looking at older brothers or sisters or watching parents could be a major important part of understanding and developing our sense of how we think. And so Vygotsky's work also allows us to take into account cultural and religious and other differences in how we develop and understand how we can develop differently based on what's happening in our environment. He also disagreed with Piaget in a few key concepts. For instance, Vygotsky wrote about how private speech was particularly an interesting cognitive developmental skill. Private speech is the idea that a young child may not have a narrative voice in their head, but they may exhibit that narrative voice out loud. When a young child around age three or four or five is talking to themselves, Vygotsky said this was very beneficial. It helped them to problem solve, it helped them to construct a narrative and better understand their world. And he considered it a very beneficial thing. In comparison, Piaget wrote that private speech was considered a sign of immaturity. So they definitely disagreed on that point. Vygotsky also wrote that make-believe and imagination is something that's helpful through the whole, whole lifespan, whereas Piaget thought it was something really limited to our preschool years. So if he was still alive today, I'm sure Vygotsky would be much more interested in those adults who believe in role-playing and Dungeons and & Dragons and building narratives for themselves than Piaget would have been. In addition to these concepts, Vygotsky also introduced a few new concepts such as the zone of proximal development. So Vygotsky believed that we, as we develop, there's some skills that are within our range or within our grasp and some skills that are still too hard. If you imagine this bar on the left, we can think of it as going vertically down with the skills at the top being especially easy. And if we're the little blue circle, this is the skills we currently have. Practicing the skills that we've already obtained is boring. It's too easy. We're not going to be engaged. If we try and attack a skill that's much too hard for us, it's much more advanced, it's going to make us feel pressured, it's going to make us stressed, and it's not something we're ready to master. Versus if we try something that's more in this highlighted area, this is in our zone of proximal development. And, see this is, and so these are the skills we don't yet have, but that we could have, and the skills that we are within the range of obtaining. And so this is the idea that if you're going to make a spelling test for a child, and let's say they've mastered some words already, they know how to spell words like cat and mat and rat, and you're trying to think of words for them to learn how to spell, maybe what's in the zone of proximal development may be similar length words, something like bet and met and pet. Those might be similar types of words that now they're ready to try and spell. If you try to give them words like believe, receive, deceive, after they learn cat, bat, hat, they are probably going to become overwhelmed. And so this idea of giving them stuff in a stepwise fashion, feeding them information and feeding them skills as they're ready for the skills can help us to thrive. So it's the idea of understanding when you might be teaching under or giving them something that's understimulating or teaching over or giving them something that's too difficult or overstimulating. By teaching to the zone of proximal development, this helps to increase self-efficacy. We believe in ourselves. We feel more confident about our skill sets and it makes us feel more reassured because it's building on the skills we already have. As we talk about literacy and numeracy, it's important that when you're helping a child to become more literate in numeracy or literacy, it needs to build on these building blocks. You can't just say they're great reading at grade one level. We need to be have them reading by grade four level this week. That's not how it works. You have to keep them in the zone of proximal development. Now, how the zone works is through this mechanism known as scaffolding. So what Vygotsky meant by scaffolding was not necessarily building construction, but it was taken from that word. So if you think about building something, the, the scaffolding is sort of the support system that goes up inside a building or a statue that allows it to not fall down while it's being constructed. 
And so scaffolding works the same way in cognitive development. This is the idea that if somebody is really struggling with math and they're not understanding some basic arithmetic, we don't just make them feel bad or we don't punish them. We might lead them through the examples. We might show them the examples and work it through ourselves and guiding them through it. And we might have to do that many times over and it might be really repetitive. And then as they start to get it, we can maybe pause before we write the answer or pause before we ask about the order of operations or pause before the next step and let them try Try and fill in the gaps. As the learner continues to fill in the gaps, we can pull back our support a little bit more and more and allow them to do more of the work. An important thing with scaffolding is it's not teacher-led, it's learner-led. So another example, let's imagine we're using scaffolding to help someone learn how to ride a bike. And at first there's training wheels on the bike or the teacher is holding onto the handlebars in the back of the seat and helping them to maintain their balance. What happens is the teacher doesn't let go when they feel they're ready. You have to wait until the learner feels comfortable and shows they're ready. So you make sure that the learner has the skill sets first, not that the teacher becomes impatient or feels the learner ought to be ready. And so this is learner led and it's the idea of allowing gradual independence or gradual autonomy over a situation to help build up that self-confidence and that self-efficacy. And through using scaffolding in the zone of proximal development, Vygotsky believed this allowed us to adjust to many different things in life. It allowed us to have more of a growth mindset. It allowed us to master many different things. And because of the type of scaffolding and the types of skills we practice are different in different cultures, this scaffolding would look different depending on what skill set you're learning. So together, Piaget and Vygotsky offered a good framework for understanding how the next big set of skills work together. So next up, we're gonna tackle all these puzzle pieces scattered around on the screen and see how they fit together in terms of our cognitive development.